thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people as we come. I will pray, Lord, that the Bible study will penetrate every heart and give us progress in our Christian journey in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, you use us to help other people to come to the Lord and to be strong in the Lord in the grace of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. Can see that we're coming back to the book of Daniel. At present, we're studying the book of Daniel every Monday at this period. And today, we're looking at Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 and 44 and 45. Open your Bible to Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in brief. Now come to verse 44. In verse 44 it says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be led to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45, it says in verse 45, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. That's the dream that uh, God had given to Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't to live for himself. It wasn't to live for Babylon. It wasn't to live for the present kingdom at that time. It was for all the kingdoms of the world until the coming of Christ. When we talk about the coming of Christ, there are two aspects of the coming of Christ. Number one, he came the first time to save, to deliver and to purify and to prepare the people, everyone, for the kingdom of God. That was the time that the Bible talks about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He came for the first time as savior. But now he's coming the second time at the smiting stone. It's coming the second time before, between the first time he came and the second time that he will come. There will be kingdoms of the world. At first we have the kingdom of Babylon. And then we have the Middle Persian Empire, another kingdom. And then the Grecian kingdom, another kingdom. And then the Roman a kingdom. All those kingdoms have been operating and reigning all over the world. They were watched 
empires. And when Christ came, it was the time of the Roman Empire. And that the Roman Empire to be the last in this interpretation of the revelation of the dream. And then at the end, Christ has now, he has now saved many people, he sanctified many people, he purged them from their sins, he has purified them them what we are waiting for now which is the latter part of this dream is the rapture when Christ will come from heaven and those who have died in Christ and those who are still alive in Christ the dead will be raised up resurrection and then those who are alive will be cut off to meet the Lord in the air that is the rapture after that there will be seven years of the great tribulation that is the time that the Antichrist will be reigning and the time of the Antichrist is actually the final part of the Roman government, the world will be under that great emperor, the Antichrist, the one that will subject the world to a lot of suffering. And then, seven years after the rapture, Christ will come. And when Christ comes, he'll destroy the Antichrist. He'll destroy the kingdoms of the world at that time under the Antichrist. And he will set up his own millennial reign all over the world. That's what he's saying about the stone that smote that idol, that smote all those kingdoms. And then after they are smashed, after they are stricken, after they are smitten, they become like chaff. And then the wind of the judgment of God will wipe them up, will take them away. And Christ will, ex will uh, kind of establish his own millennial kingdom kingdom all over the world. That's why it says the stone became a mountain and the mountain filled the whole earth and he has a kingdom and he has a dominion that will be forever and ever. It will never be displaced again. It will not be destroyed but it will rule forever and ever. From the millennial kingdom they will have the everlasting, the eternal kingdom where Christ will reign and the saints of God, the children of God will reign with him. That's the summary of what we're looking at. Today we're looking at the striking prophecy of the smiting, smiting stone. The striking prophecy, the Old Testament revealed that the stone, that's our savior, and as the sovereign, it was the smitten stone, the smitten savior. It was smitten, it was broken, it was slain, it was crucified, it died for our sins. That's the smitten stone, the smitten savior. But then he comes back as the sovereign. He comes back as the ruler. He comes back as the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he will not be smitten at that time. He'll be the smitten stone the mighty sovereign and then in his power supernatural power he will reign the message today the study today the striking prophecy of the smitten's mighty stone. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, we're looking at the divinity of the mighty stone. The divinity of the mighty stone. That's the stone that was caught without human hand. And then it came and struck at the image. And that mighty stone divine in origin. He has his deity because he's the son of God and he is God himself. That's why he has divinity, the divinity of the mighty stone. Number two, the day of the supreme stone. In the days of the kings, that is, Babylon had its own day. Middle Persian kingdom at its own day, and the Grecian government at its own day, and the Roman kingdom at their own day. In the days of those kings, in the days of those emperors, in the days of those empires, then Christ will have its own day. The 
day of the supreme stone. We're looking at number three, the dominion. He'll have a dominion. He'll have a kingdom. And his kingdom and dominion will never come to an end, will never be destroyed, will never be displaced, and will never be under any other dominion. He is the final one. He's the future one. He's the forever one that will reign forever and ever. The dominion of the sovereign stone. Now, let's look at he from number one. Number one, we're looking at the divinity of the smited stone. The three things we're looking at here, we're looking at uh, number one, the supernatural stone. Number two, seven things actually. Uh, then the stumbling stone. Then number three, the scorn stone. Number four is the sure corner stone. And then number five, the smiting stone. Number six, the shattering stone. And number seven, the sovereign stone. And all about Christ. We're talking about Christ. We're talking about Christ in a universal way. When he came the first time, and when he's coming, he'll be coming the second time. Look at number one here. Number one, he is the supernatural stone. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34. It says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. That's not natural. If you're going to cut any branch of the tree, there should be a hand that is making use of the axe. If you're going to cut out a stone from a mountain, there should be a hand that is uh, getting that stone out. But this one says that that stone was cut out without hands. What does that mean? Without the human agency without the natural agents. Have you noticed the prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ, supernatural, without human help, and then the conception, supernatural, without a human age, and the birth of Jesus, supernatural, without a human age, and the life he lived, a, a, a great life, a life of righteousness, a life of holiness, a life of heaven on earth, supernatural, without human help, and the way he endured all the trials, and all the persecution, everything supernatural, and and the wisdom he manifested when they asked him a question that could have dribbled him wisdom from heaven without human help and then his crucifixion and then his death is he already dead? And they said, yes, all the others on the cross was still alive. So supernatural. And then the third day, he rose from the dead without a human help. And then after 40 days of revealing himself to his disciples, he went up to heaven. They saw him. He was lifted up. There was no robe. There was no pulley. There was nothing. He went up and was going to heaven until he vanished from their sight with without human help and then he's coming back again the skies will open and then they will come with the clouds and with myriads of angels everyone supernatural then he will take his own children the saints of God he'll take them away in the rapture without human aid that's why it's seen that that stone that came and struck against the man against the image it was a divine, supernatural stone. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 31. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name. Everybody tell me. Tell me his name. Jesus, look at verse 32. In verse 32, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, because he will reign forever and ever. Verse 33, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. His kingdom 
kingdom, his dominion will be forever and ever. Verse 34, in verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seen? I know not a man. This is the one that will come without human agent and without the natural way of coming into the world. How shall I know this? How shall this happen? Seen? I know not a man. Verse 35. In verse 35, the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow shadow thee therefore also that holy thing heavenly thing sinless thing spotless one which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of god number one the supernatural stone number two the stumbling stone the stumbling stone he came into this world and then when he came the jews could not recognize him the nation of israel could not recognize him the powers that be the powers that were and the uh, the, the leaders of the land they couldn't understand it became a stumbling block i say chapter 8 we're reading from verse 14 it says and he shall be for his sanctuary but for his stone a stone a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of israel for a gene and for a share for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. When they saw him, they stumbled at him because of his uh, personality. He didn't announce to them, I am the Christ. They were wondering, is this the Christ? Is this the Christ? We've heard that Christ will be born in Bethlehem. And then they were confused about their understanding of his life. And yet they saw him doing things that no man ever did. Saving souls, transforming lives and changing lives and healing the people that were sick. Even the demons were saying, we know thee. He shut them up and he cast them out but all the same those Jewish people fell at because they stumbled at him look at verse 16 in verse 16 it says bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples it's first peter chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 8 in first peter chapter 2 verse 8 and a stone of stumbling you see it's talking about christ and it says christ when he came the first time he'll be a stone of stumbling a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed that is they couldn't see him as the savior they couldn't see him as the substitute they couldn't see him at the final sacrifice john announced as they behold the lamb of god we take it away the sin of the world and yet they couldn't see and jesus told them if you do not believe that i am he you will die in your sins number two then it was the stumbling stone we're looking at number three it was the scorned stone the scorned stone they despised him they rejected him they belittled him they looked down on him is that the one that will save us is that the one that will take us away from the kingdom of darkness and take us to the kingdom of light look at isaiah chapter 53 we're reading from verse 3 he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we did heed as it were our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not discount him 
they looked down on him. They rejected him. They, they exalted their opinion above his message. They exalted their religion above his righteousness. They rejected his revelation and they kept to their own dogmas. That's how they scorned him. Are there people today that have heard of Christ? Are there people today that have gone to Christian schools and after spending years in the Christian school and they heard of Christ that he is the Savior and they heard we're sinners, they heard we cannot save ourselves, they heard only Christ can save and that they needed to repent and give their lives to the Lord and be born again because that is the only way Christ will recognize them and God will recognize them when their names enter into the book of life but they have preferred their own religion above the righteousness and the revelation that Christ has brought to us in the world. He was a scorned stone. And many people still scorn him today. Look at chapter 23 of Luke. Luke chapter 23, we're reading from verse 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others and let him now save himself if he be the Christ and the chosen of God. That's the scorn, the arch against him. They were scornful. And because they scorned him, they couldn't believe him. You cannot scorn somebody and still believe him and still love him and still accept him and know that he's the most important personality in your life. When you look down somebody, when you scorn somebody, when you despise somebody, you cannot say the most essential person in your world, in your life. And because that is what they did, belittling him and scorning him, him and uh, you know deriding him they couldn't believe in him as the only savior they couldn't believe in him as the only way that leads to heaven but blessed are the people who have seen that Christ is the only name by which we can be saved blessed are those who have seen that only through him through Christ Christ alone because of his substitutionary work because of his final sacrifice that only Christ can take us from our sin and bring us to salvation. And because of that, they bow before him and they bend the knee before him and they repent and they turn away from their sins and they fully, wholeheartedly, completely, without reservation, they abandon themselves to the Lord. They say, you are the only Savior. If I'm going to be saved, you are the one that will save me but the scorners will not do that. That is why they will be lost. Number four now, the sure cornerstone. The sure cornerstone. When you're building a building, you need to have the cornerstone. It's actually in their own system, in the Jewish plan. It's through that cornerstone you will measure and regulate the whole edifice, the whole building. Once it aligns with the cornerstone, then you know you can build. And if any storm comes, the house is not at an angle. It's not because it's quality built is solidly built on the cornerstone and the storms of life will not be able to pull down or raise or destroy that building and Jesus Christ in the spiritual sense Jesus Christ is the foundation and is the chief cornerstone and when you build your life of faith you build your life of holiness on that cornerstone whatever trials come you will overcome whatever temptations come 
your will overcome. And whatever winds blow, you'll be steadfast and solid. You'll be sustained in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 28, and we're reading from verse 14. It says in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14, wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule uh, the, this people which is in Jerusalem. And then he tells us in verse 16, in verse 16, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay Zion for a foundation a stone. We're talking about the, the smite stone. The stone that will come eventually and all those empires and all the gold and the silver and the brass and the iron and the clay. The stone that will come and smite them and they'll be torn into powder and they'll be torn into chaff and the wind of the judgment of God will wipe them up and sweep them up. That's the stone we're talking about now and it says behold I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make his he that believeth shall not be confounded he that believeth will pass away from judgment and the shame of his past sin and the shame of his past life and the shame and the suffering of the past life will not be recorded against him anymore because that is the sure cornerstone of which we can build a spiritual life and in the day of judgment you will not be ashamed in Jesus name and then we come into verse 17 there verse 17 tells us judgment also shall I will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plumage and the hill shall sweep away the refuge of lies the people that depend on other gods refuge of lies the people that look for salvation in false gods in false idols refuge of lies and the people that depend on salvation for the works of their hand I'm good I'm great I'm this I'm that I'm nice I'm kind hearted they depend on the refuge of lies they'll come to shame and it says and the waters and the flood of judgment shall overflow their hiding place and we're looking at this now in first peter chapter 2 verse 6 in first peter chapter 2 verse 6 it says wherefore also is it is contained in the scripture look at that new testament is calling the old testament scripture it said all those things you read in the old testament isaiah jeremiah ezekiel Hosea, and all the prophets of the old testament from genesis all to malachi it said that is the scripture that is the scripture it says it is contained in the scripture behold i lay in zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth on him he calls him stone and normally you don't say him for a stone the stone is used figuratively for christ for our Savior. That's why now we can refer to Him as Him. He said, Precious, and he that believeth on Him shall not be confounded. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, Unto you therefore which believe, He is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, rejected, neglected, pushed away from them the stone which the religious builders disallowed. And he said, crucify him and let his blood be upon us. He says, that same Christ, that same stone, that same Savior is made the head of the corner. We're looking at number five. Number five, he is the smite stone. He is the smite stone. You see, Christ is not only Savior. Christ is not 
not, not only sanctify Christ, it's not only baptizer in the Holy Ghost Christ, it's not only healer. Yes, he is, he is a savior. Yes, he is, he is a sanctifier. Yes, he is, he is a baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Yes, he is, he is the healer. Yet, he's also the coming king and he is the judge because the father has committed all judgment into his son. Number five now is the smiting stone. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 11 and we're reading on verse 4. Isaiah chapter 11, reading from verse 4, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall look at this look at this he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth his judge and when he comes all the world empires gold silver brass iron clay the babylonian government and the middle persian government and the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire and all the empires of the world that would have ruled until this time, this is the one that will judge and smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the bread of his leaves shall he slay the wicked. And we're coming to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 19 reading from verse 15 and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with siege it shall smite smite you see that what we're reading about in daniel that that stone caught without hands will come and smite that image that's the word again it's talking about when it will judge all the kingdoms of this world that he shall smite the nations and that he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the wine prayers of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. It tells us in verse 16. In verse 16 it says, And he and he, as on his vesture and on his thigh, in name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, when he establishes his dominion that will never pass away, and when he establishes that kingdom that will never pass away, and he fills the whole earth, he'll be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're looking at number six. Number six, he is the shattering stone. He is the shattering stone. He shatters everything. He destroys everything shakeable. It will shake. Everything that had been in this way as he comes to reign, all those things that will shatter and take out of the way. It tells us in Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 45, it says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, and the clay, and the, and the silver, and the gold, the great God has revealed, has made known to the king, to Nebuchadnezzar, what shall come to pass hereafter, hereafter. It wasn't to happen at that time. The golden empire will come and go. And then the silver representing the empire that will follow, that will come and go. And the brass representing the one that will follow, the Lord is patient. He's patient for us because he doesn't want anyone to perish. That will come and go. And then the iron and the clay, that will come. And then at the end, that the kingdoms of the world, they have had their own day. They have had their own time. Now God has his own day and his own time. And that stone will come and shatter all those kingdoms that's what we're you know looking at here and then he tells us in Matthew chapter 21 I'm reading from verse 42 Matthew chapter 21 verse 42 Jesus saith unto them did ye never read in the scriptures again he's referring to the Old Testament and he's calling the Old Testament
Testament, the scriptures, the scriptures, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All the Old Testament scriptures given by, by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable for doctrine, profitable for reproof, and profitable for instruction in righteousness that the child of God, the man of God, the believer in the kingdom may be made perfect, matured, prepared for the coming of the Lord. Because that scripture is what purges us and prepare us to be what we ought to be in the kingdom. Jesus here called the Old Testament scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same is become the hedge of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Look at uh, uh, the next verse there, verse 43. It says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you Jews, from you Israelites, and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. Verse 44, very important, very important. Verse 44, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. That is, whosoever by himself with conviction, with confession, with confidence in him as the one, the only one that can save, he falls at his feet. He says, I detest myself. I reject my own life. I am a sinner. He falls at his feet with tears of conviction and with tears of contrition in the heart. He falls at his feet with faith in the Lord that you are the Savior, the Savior of mankind and my Savior. He said, it shall be broken. That he shall have broken heart and a broken spirit and a broken mind and that God will not despise. He'll be converted. He'll be saved. He'll come to the Lord and say, Now my sins are taken away. But, but, but on whomsoever it shall fall. That is, these people that are still standing there will belong to this empire, will belong to this religion, will belong to this society, will belong to that assembly, and they do not come and fall in repentance and faith before him, and they wait until their judgment day. It says, but whomsoever this stone shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. That's the stone that comes and then it shatters them. They're ground to powder and the wind of the judgment of God, the whirlwind of the judgment of God will come and sweep them away. Number seven, he is the sovereign stone. The sovereign stone that is the one that lives and reigns forever and ever. In Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 35, there was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, and that no place was found for them, no place on earth was found for them, because the the wind sweeps them away to the great beyond, to hell. Now they suffer forever and ever. They could have been forgiven, but they were not broken in heart. They could have been saved, but they did not have the believer's heart to come to the Lord. They could have escaped the judgment of God, but they didn't look at Jesus Christ at that sure cornerstone, the only one that can save. And so they, they waited until the last time, until this sovereign stone was smite 
them and there was no place on the earth for them and now they go to hell and he tells us after they've gone like that and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole and Jesus shall reign wherever the sun shines all over the earth every continent the time is coming when Christ will be the King and the Lord and he will reign forever and ever we're looking at verse 44 in verse 44 he tells us and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven is God that orchestrates all this is God that plans all this is God that ordains all this is God that decrees all this it says in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and the kingdom that God establishes shall stand forever. We're looking at Psalm 2. In Psalm 2, we're reading there from verse 1. In Psalm 2, we're looking at verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? Babylonian government, heathen. All the Middle Persian uh, Empire, heathen. The Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, heathen, and the Roman Empire, heathen, and all of them were reigning without putting God into, into account. And it says, Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying in verse 3 let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In verse 4 it says he that sitteth in the heaven shall love. The Lord shall have them in great derision. Why? God knows he has the final say. God knows he has as the final plan. It's his world. It's his earth. He created the earth. He created the world. And it belongs to him. And all those that were reigning are not showing gratitude to him. And they are not showing uh, any kind of a uh, difference. They are not showing any kind of gratitude. He laughs at them. They think that he created the world and then he has abandoned the world and they are now reigning on the earth. But God shall laugh at them. It will vex them in his uh, in his sore displeasure and they were looking at verse 5 in verse 5 it says then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure verse 6 it says verse 6 yet whatever they say yet and however they react yet even though they reject yet yet have I said my king uh, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar that's not mine, that's not mine, it's ruling by his own ideology. And then all the Middle Cyprus and Cyrus and Darius, they're leading by their own principles. But I have my king, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Then in verse 7 it says, I will declare the decree, the decree, the word that cannot be reversed, the prophecy that cannot be displayed and be displaced. The Lord said, I declare, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, the Father said to the Son, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. Then verse 8 tells us, it says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. All those uh, kingdoms and all those empires that all the foreign heathen kings were reigning over. 
Jehovah, you are my son. I've made the decree. You are the king that will reign. And he says, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. In verse 9, it says, and thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Here comes now, look at verse 10. In verse 10, be wise now. Therefore, O ye kings, now it's not the time to rebel. It's the time to rely on him. It's not the time to stand back and stand and look and say, I don't know the man. I don't know Christ. He's your savior. He's willing. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Be wise. Be wise. And be wise in the light of eternity. Be wise in the light of the decree that the Heavenly Father has made and surrender and submit and be saved by this kind. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings be instructed, ye judges of the earth. And then in verse 11 it says, serve the Lord or fear. Don't think you are the only, not Nebuchadnezzar. You know Nebuchadnezzar God can so handle you and deal with you that you will know that the God of heaven he has the final say serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling verse 12 in verse 12 kiss the son believe the son befriend the son yield allegiance to the son give your whole heart and love him with all your heart all your soul and all your mind kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him he is the stone he is the stone that will be cut out from the mountain and smite the image of the four empires before the second coming of the lord and then there's no place for, for them again and also believe in the lord will reign with him forever and ever and the church will say Amen. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the day of the supreme stone. The day of the supreme stone. We're looking at Daniel chapter two, and I'm reading from verse 44. It says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. In the days of these of these kings, while well, the days of reigning and ruling are running on, then God will choose one day, an appointed day, one day, an approaching day, one day, an appealing day. He says he's going to choose a day, and that day it will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall be break in pieces then consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever a day a day that god himself will begin his final future everlasting reign. Look at um, Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 31. Acts chapter 17, verse 31, because he has appointed a day. God has appointed a day. He sees everything going on in the world. He sees everything going on in every country. He sees everything going on in our country. And it appears that God has abandoned the earth. How could this be happening? How could that be happening if God is still alive? Yes, he's alive. He has his own day and he has appointed a day. Look at that. He said because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained by that stone that will be cut out of the mountain and will strike against the image he will do that whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised 
him from the dead. Three things we're looking at here concerning the supreme the day of the supreme stone. Number one, the appointed day for the smashing stone. Number two, is the approaching day of the smiting stone. Number three, is the appealing day day of a sympathetic substitute. Look at number one. Number one is the appointed day for the smashing stone. It tells us in Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 30, in verse 30 and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now, day of grace, but now, day of mercy, now, period, we can repent, now, day of salvation but now commandeth all men all men whether they are babylon whether they are media whether they are in persia whether they are in greece whether they're in rome any continent of the world any country of the world now the god of heaven says this is the day of mercy and this is the day of salvation but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent why do we repent for start one so that we don't wait too long because he has appointed a day in the which I will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead we're looking at Joel chapter 2 the appointed day of the smashing stone a day appointed by god joel chapter 2 verse 1 blow the trumpet in zion sound an alarm in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the lord cometh the day of the Lord cometh. He has appointed a day when after people have rejected mercy, they have rejected grace, they have rejected his patience, they have rejected his love, they have rejected his salvation, then the final day, the day of the Lord comes that has been appointed and it says over here, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is near at hand. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it tells us a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong there has not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And that's a double, uh, double prong prophecy. At that time in the own land, a day was coming upon the strength of devastation. There's a second part of fulfillment that the day of the Lord, when there will be a great judgment, look at verse 3 there. In verse 3 it says, and a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is at the garden of Eden before them, before they came there, but behind them, after they have gone through, behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Look at verse 11 there. In verse 11 it tells us, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth his word for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it? In verse 31, verse 31, the sun shall be turned to darkness. You know that is still future, that's still future. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible 
day of the Lord. Try to imagine that if in the afternoon the sun all just became darkened all over the world and then the moon turned into blood and you know that a terrible day is coming and this will not be the day of mercy and the day of grace and the day of salvation and the day of the love of God and the day of forgiveness. It will be the day of terrible judgment upon the earth. Uh, look at uh, Sephaniah. We're looking at uh, chapter 1 verse 17. Sephaniah chapter 17, chapter 1 verse 17. Uh, and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be upon, shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. And then in verse 18, verse 18 then tells us, it says, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to, uh, to deliver them, them in the day of the Lord's so wrath. That the day we're talking about, the day of the Lord, when that devastation will come, and it's the appointed day for the smashing stone. It says, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy that he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land because they have rejected salvation then the suffering of judgment will come upon them because they have rejected the love of God and they remain lawless in their lifestyle the day of God that the judgment will come the smiting stone that is caught out of the mountain without hands will come upon them they will not escape the judgment of God. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm coming to verse 10. In Second Peter chapter 3, looking at verse 10, look at this, but the day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come. As it says in the Old Testament scriptures, it says now and emphasizes in the New Testament scripture, the same prophecy, talking about the same day, the same day that is appointed for the judgment of the world, for the judgment of all sinners in the world. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. The people who say, I'm busy trying to build this, I'm busy trying to establish that, I'm busy trying to manage this company, I'm busy trying to build and work on this project, the day of the Lord. When the day of the Lord comes, all those things who are trying to build, all those things who are trying to raise, all those things who are trying to marriage, none of them will stand the devouring fire of the day of the Lord and it's only the salvation we have it's only the righteousness of faith that we have it's only the holiness without which no man shall say the Lord that we have that will make us escape that comedy number one is the appointed day of the smashing stone number two now is the approaching day of the smiting stone that day is approaching look at the number of years that uh, Daniel had interpreted the dream and look at, you know, uh, Babylonian uh, Empire gone and were drawing nearer and then the Middle Persian government gone, were drawing nearer, the Grecian government gone, were drawing nearer and the Roman government is going and the day is now approaching and we're nearer the day of judgment today, that devastating day, that gloomy day, that terrible day, that great day, we're nearer now than at the time of Daniel. Don't sleep, don't slumber, don't be sluggish, don't look back because the day is approaching. Number two, the approaching day of the mighty stone. In Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 6. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6, how ye 
For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Verse 8, verse 8 says, And they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travail that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall gather, their faces shall be as flames. And then in verse 9, in verse 9, behold, the day of the Lord cometh, it's approaching, it's approaching, approaching fast. The day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it that they will be looking for the sinner those who remain in their sin habitual sin common sin secret sin public sin private sin and they will not repent they heard about the savior but they're too busy on their own private personal agenda they're too busy on seeking pleasure they're still they're too busy on building the world they do not have time for salvation and they remain sinners and god sees them as sinners they are without Christ they are without grace they are without godliness and they are without the salvation of the Lord and the Lord says he shall destroy sinners out of it look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give up their light the sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Verse 11, in verse 11 it says, I will punish and I will punish the world, I'll punish the world, I'll punish all the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of offer. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day in the day in the day of his fierce anger that day is coming and that day is approaching that day is nearer than any other time before in first Thessalonians chapter 5 reading from verse 1 first Thessalonians chapter 5 reading from verse Verse 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. In verse 2 it says, but in verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh. Old Testament, New Testament confirmation, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Then in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, everything is going fine, and the world has now gotten civilized, and then there, is the, there are the peacemakers in the various nations, and all those nations are going to bring peace in the world, and how they say we see all the utopian uh, kind of expectation that we have, it's coming. They say there's no judgment anywhere, there's no terror anywhere. They, they, have, they manage everything. They have set up all the, all the earth and universe you know, uh, companies or, or committees in the whole universe, they have assured us peace has now come. Then it says, for when they shall see peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman or child, and they shall not 
escape and they shall not escape. Revelation chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 15. It says in verse, and the kings of the earth and the, and the great men and the rich men and the chief uh, captains and the mighty men and every bondman, bondman and every, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the caves of the mountains. Why? Verse 16. In verse 16, and search unto to the mountains for and to the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17 for the great day of his wrath is come it's coming it's coming and it's so very near if you're not saved yet there's the time to get saved if you're not sanctified you don't have the holiness without which no man shall see the lord this is the time to abandon every other thing and give priority to this if you have hatred in your heart if you have animosity there, if you are bearing grudges there, if you are fighting, psychological fighting over there, if you are violent over there, for the peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If there is cut and rat relationship in the home between husband and wife, between parents and children, this is the time to hands off everything and come before the Lord and make peace and and let the Prince of Peace rule in your heart and follow that holiness that will make us, help us to see the Lord, of uh, the face of the Lord in glory for the day, for the great day of His wrath has come and you shall be able to stand. We're looking at number three here. Number three here, we're looking at the appealing day of a sympathetic substitute. Today, He is our Savior. Today, Today, he is our substitute. Today, he is sympathetic with us. He knows that we cannot conquer sin by ourselves. He says, I want to help you. Why don't you allow me into your life? He brings the peace of God today. This is the day of grace and the day of salvation and the day of mercy and the day of the love of God. This is the time to make peace with God. Look at Micah chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 9. Micah chapter 7 verse 9. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment on my behalf for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. It says if you have sinned and because of that you see some repercussions and some consequences and you are reaping the fruit of the evil that you have done. It says don't be angry with God. Who is wrong? Is God wrong who has visited you because of your sin? Are you not the wrong one? That's why it says come and plead before the Lord in Micah chapter 7 verse 18 in verse 18 it says who oh, is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity when you plead he's been pleading with you when you come and you say yes Lord you're not the one to even plead with me I'm the one to plead with you I'm the simple one I'm the guilty one and then good enough you sent your only begotten son to die for me who am I that you should pay such a price on my behalf look at the suffering of Christ and look at the substitution of Christ and because of that come unto him as he's even appealing what you come and plead your cause who is a God a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy today today he delights in mercy the day is coming 
when they will not delight in mercy, when it will be the day of wrath, the day of judgment, the day of fiery indignation. But today, the mercy of God is still there. Why don't you come? He delighteth in mercy today. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. In verse 20, he tells us, he says, Thou will perform the truth unto Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 18. We're reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. And all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation in verse 19 verse 19 says to which that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them mercy grace love it says and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation look at verse 20 in verse 20 it says now then we are ambassadors for christ as though god did beseech you by us pleading with you by us we pray you we plead with you we beg of you in christ's stage be ye reconciled unto God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9. It says, The Lord is not, is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. The Lord is not slack concerning the prophecy that he will come. He will judge the world and the wickedness of the wicked that time will be brought to record and the sinfulness of the sinners that day will be, will be brought into the limelight and there will be a devastating judgment upon the world. Why has God not done that? Even though we know the day is approaching the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering towards words, not willing that any should perish, but that all, all, all should come to repentance. Then he tells us in verse 10, he wants us to come to repentance, but he has not forgotten the day, the day coming, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. In verse 11, in verse 11, seeing then that all these shall be dissolved. It will happen. All these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Verse 12, in verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, in verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's why you prepare yourself, you have the righteousness that comes through grace so that when that day will come the Lord will have taken you away in the rapture 
I thought somebody would say amen. amen. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three, the dominion of the sovereign stone. In Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 44, we're looking at the dominion of the sovereign stone now. It says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Look at uh, verse 45. In verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God of heaven, the great God has made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure three things we're looking at number one the present dominion over submissive sanctified stones number two the prophetic dominion over sinning scorning stones number three the perpetual dominion of the saving sanctifying son number one is the present dominion that christ the savior christ the sanctifier christ the baptizer christ the lord and king the present dominion he has over those who are submissive and sanctified we're looking at first peter chapter 2 we're looking at verse 5 first peter chapter 2 verse 5 he also as lively stones. He refers to the believers as stones, lively stones. The deadness that sin brought in our lives, all that deadness have been removed. We're quickened, we're made alive. We now live in Christ, and Christ lives in us. He also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9 in verse 9 it says but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness out of sin out of all the degradation that you had in the past he has called you out of dark, covered, hidden, secret sinning, and he has called you into the marvelous light, into his marvelous light. It makes us sense. And now he has dominion over us. In Isaiah chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 13. I say 26, verse 13, O Lord, our God, who are repented, is now our God. Was saved is now our God. We're now lively stones is now our God. We're built into the spiritual temple is now our God. Oh Lord, our God, all that lords beside thee have had dominion over us in the past. They had dominion over us in the past. They had authority over us in the past. They ruled our lives and controlled our lives by their sinful power. All the lords have had dominion on, on, upon us, over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. He, he only is now the one that has dominion over us. Let's come to number two here. Number two here, we're looking at the prophetic dominion <clears throat> over sinning, scorning stones. <clears throat> the uh, prophetic dominion over sinning, 
scorny na stone. We're looking at uh, Zechariah chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 12. Zechariah chapter 7, we're reading from verse 12. It says, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Yeah, there are sinners who make their hearts as hard as adamant stone. The word comes to them, it will not penetrate. The water of the word comes into them, it will not go in and refresh them. The fire of the word burns around them, they shake it off. They will not allow the word to bring conviction to them, to bring conversion to them. They make their hearts as hard as Adam and stone. The more they hear, the more they sin. The more they hear, the more they scorn. The more they hear, the more they rebel. And it says, Yea, how can this be? They have made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the word which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. The people that hear the word of love, the word of mercy, the word of salvation, and the words of the goodness of God, and yet they remain adamant and sin. But the day of the Lord is approaching. The day of the Lord is coming. Eventually, if they remain like that, and they die in that condition, or they remain like that until the rapture happens, pity for them, sorrowful we are for them, They'll be lost. They'll die in their sin. All their bravado and all their courage, all their rebellion against the word of the Lord. They will regret not only for one day, one week, one month, one year. They'll regret for eternity. Whoever they are, whoever they are here or over there, young or old, the people that rebel against the word of salvation with an adamant stony heart the regret for all eternity it tells us in verse 13 in verse 13 it says therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear so they cried and i will not hear says the lord of hosts then in verse 14 in verse 14 it says but I scattered them with a wild wind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. We'll come to number three here. Number three, we're looking at the perpetual dominion of the saving, sanctifying stone. He saves today as we're called upon him. He sanctifies as we're called upon him and he gives us grace, abundant grace, sufficient grace so that we'll live the life that meets him in peace when he comes. And then when he comes to reign to have the everlasting kingdom, those who are saved and sanctified and they abide in the Lord and they're sustained by the grace of God. They will live forever and ever with him in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 13. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. I saw the, in the night vision and behold the one, one like the son of man came to him, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him the son of man before him the ancient of days look at verse 14 in verse 14 and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him his dominion is tell me his dominion is shout it shout it 
and everlasting dominion we shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed look at verse 27 in verse 27 and the kingdom and dominion and the great and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given unto the people of the saints of the most high are the saints here tonight i said are the saints here tonight here and there and everywhere saved souls sanctified souls it says and that dominion everlasting shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him you'll be there what are you i said you'll be there all the grace you need, all the strength you need, all the love and the mercy of God you need will be showered upon your life and He'll prepare you. When the Lord will come, He will get you safe and secured in His chamber, in His kingdom. One is fighting the Antichrist and fighting all the rebels of the world. You'll be safe in the dominion kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Let's stand up now and pray to the Lord that the Lord will grant us the grace, saving grace, sanctifying grace, sustaining grace that will be steadfast until that final day. Pray and the Lord will make you ready, qualified, abiding in the Lord until that final day. Prophecy was given to them.